Welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks. I'm Lori LeBay, the host and founder of Alzheimer's Speaks. Um, for those of you that are new to the show and, uh, and to myself, I'm just going to give you a little background. My mom had dementia for 30 years, and so for me, it was life-changing. She started uh, having uh, some dementia symptoms in her mid-50s and lived till 86. And so in about 2009, I decided to switch careers and um, try to make a difference, try to shift our dementia care from what I call crisis to comfort around the world. And so I formulated Alzheimer's Speaks, which really is an advocacy-based company that provides multiple platforms um, to raise everyone's voices. I, I don't think any of us can do this job alone, and I think we need to be inspired by one another and um, hear what all sides think about this disease and how we should care for those that are diagnosed with it. And so I just adore having these conversations um, where we just do true talk radio um, and we talk about joining forces and sharing knowledge and just having intimate conversations about life with dementia and how we can remove stigmas and how we can all become better care partners and, and help people live um, full life. At our core, Alzheimer's Speaks also believes that collaboration is the only way that we are going to win this battle against dementia. And I know it's working thanks to each and every one of you. You see, your likes, your clicks, and your shares have moved mountains. Um, you got us recognized as the number one influencer online, according to Share Care and Dr. Oz. Um, Maria Shriver has noticed us for our work um, and um, named us one of her architects of change. And again, the only reason that is happening is, is through, through all of you. Um, and in spreading the word, uh, sharing the knowledge that we you're here in the content and um, letting others know about it because there's nothing worse than feeling out of the loop and um, in, in not knowing where to go um, to gain information. Now, before I introduce our guest today, and we're going to be having a fun conversation um, with a couple of foodies this afternoon, um, I do want to invite any of you that are still able to. Um, we are going on our dementia friendly. Um, symposium and cruise in a month and we still have a couple of cabins open in our group um, we leave November 11th and we'll come back on the 18th and it's just going to be I think an extraordinary um, adventure and education uh, building lots of camaraderie and so um, please feel free to join us just go to alzheimerspeaks.com and you can get more more information there. We have lots of wonderful sponsors that have helped us out um, with pulling this cruise together. And I'm just going to mention a few of them. Uh, the American Senior Magazine. Um, John Hopkins is donating a couple of books. Um, Music for Wellness, the Dementia-Friendly Communities of Northern Colorado. Um, art kicks, uh, kits, uh, memory joggers, and uh, calendar cards, the Footprint ID um, organization, and the Call Alert Center are just a few. And um, we'd love to be able to give you more information on, on each of those organizations because they are all doing extraordinary work to shift um, basically dementia care from crisis to comfort. Now today we are lucky to have um, Patrick uh, Nicholson with us who has over 35 years of experience in the restaurant and hospitality industry. Um, I, lo and behold, as a small world has it, he's also a, a friend of an associate of mine. And so that was kind of fun. So I have to do a shout out to Stuart there in case he's listening. Um, 
In 2011, um, Patrick um, became the culinary director for a continuing care community, and um, he has been a corporate culinary director and has opened dining services for three new senior living um, properties in the Twin Cities area here. Now, um, his wife Dawn is a graduate of the Cordon Bleu in pastries and baking. And if you go to their website, you'll start drooling when you see the food pictures. I had a hard time, like, um, not drooling while I was looking at their website because it just looks fantastic. Um, but Dawn has been a pastry chef in fine dining in bakeries and also in the catering industry. Um, she has worked in uh, senior living in Rochester and the Twin Cities area, and she is currently the director of food and nutrition at a skilled, um, skilled nursing and transitional care uh, here in St. Paul, Minnesota as well. So welcome, Patrick and Dawn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm excited to have our conversation today, and um, typically before I go into my line of questions, I always like to ask um, my guests a, a simple question. So I'm going to ask you each the same question, and that is, have, have you been touched by dementia um, personally with friends or family? And Patrick, I'm going to let you go first. Um, you know, really the first really experience is throughout the, with when I entered into Walker um, Senior Living, most of my family had, you know, they were older, but really never diagnosed as dementia or anything like that. So really when I entered into the Senior Living. Okay. How about you, Don? Uh, my grandfather had some dementia, you know, early signs of dementia. We, he wasn't diagnosed actually until his early 90s. So shortly after his diagnosis, we moved him into an assisted living. And so far, you know, in my, you know, immediate family, that's been my only experience. So like Patrick, you know, most of my experience has been with, you know, the people that we meet throughout, um, you know, our work. Sure. Sure. And, and that is for many, many people out there. Um, and it's, it's just always interesting, I think, for, for our audience to know um, a little background on that. So thank you for, for sharing a little about your personal stories on that. Um, I want to ask, you know, why you decided to start Passion for Dining and Nutrition. And, um, and I'm going to, Dawn, I'm going to throw this one to you at first. Okay. Well, we, you know, we have a lot to offer and we, we feel like when we can do this on our own, we can touch more communities and touch more residents. And, you know, food is, a, it plays an important role in the lives of seniors, you know, dementia and, you know, in any kind of a senior living environment. And we just don't feel like it's given enough attention. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's nutrition, but it's also a big part of socialization and it brings back so many memories and, you know, it's, it's the highlight of their day. And so we started talking about together what we could do to make a difference in so many more places than, you know, just, you know, the two that we were working at and, you know, you get kind of boxed in, you do what, what your employer needs you to do at that time, instead of being able to contribute in all of the ways you know you can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Patrick, anything you want to add to that? You know, just to kind of follow up with what Don said, you know, when we had discussed, you know, what we could do, we were kind of boxed in. We were really looking to make a difference. And, you know, part of the difference is it's endless reward when you can share food. It brings back so many memories. Um, you know, like Don said, the socialization, the nutrition, you know, it plays a big part into their past life, bringing back smells, taste, eye appeal, all kinds of different things. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, Which is, well, it's very it's true. Yeah, I mean, I think I've just, you know, when I get together with my friends, you know, it's uh, cocktails or happy hour or, you know, it's that social social setting and, um, you know, of relaxation and just enjoy, enjoying 
uh, one another's company. And, you know, when you've got great food and, um, you know, service and kind of that atmosphere to boot, I mean, it's just, you know, there's not much that's better than that. Um, when you, when you feel that connected. Um, and I, and I think, you know, with, with healthcare in general, I think so many people are feeling kind of boxed in, um, because the margins have gone down, the competition has gone up and, um, and, and that makes it harder, I think for everybody's job. Plus there's a shortage of staff, which, which makes it difficult too. Um, did those things come into play for you as well? Well, uh, you know, you, you really hit it on a couple of nails right there, Lori, because the shortage of staff, the budget, you know, just talking about the budgets alone itself, you know, when, you know, you use the analogy, Don, Don has $7 a day to feed per resident for longer staff, I mean with snacks, but you look at that, it's almost $2 per meal, wow. just a hair over, and you, and when you think about that, you've got to be able to serve a starter, a starch, a protein, a vegetable, and then a dessert. So when you go out and buy a cup of coffee, you're spending $2. And that's, you know, sometimes even more than $2 a cup of coffee. And now we want to feed our residents a quality meal. Yeah. So somehow, somehow the budgets have to adjust in some, some way because we owe it to the residents to give them quality products mm-hmm. and they deserve that and, and in fact they understand quality as well yep well and so, and, and so do the families too when when they come to visit and and I think that that can have a big impact in those dining times too in terms of you know uh, taste and smell and presentation um, that that can affect I think their engagement level um, too. I, I know that, you know, when my mom was in a nursing home, you know, and at the end, you know, she was on pureed foods and there's not a whole lot you can do with pureed foods unless you're doing, the, you know, get them into the molds and, and things. But even that is, is difficult. Um, it just looks like mush, you know, on the plate. And how do you, how do you compensate for that? Um, and yet it's a physical need, you know, for the food to be delivered in that way, because that's the only way their body can tolerate that. Um, and again, there's many levels in between um, the spectrum from, especially in, in uh, senior living, you know, from market rate to assisted living to memory care and, and everything in between you know, with that. So, um, yeah, it's, it is interesting. And I think people are probably shocked at the, you know, at the budget you just threw out to feed somebody because you can't even go to McDonald's and get a happy meal for the kids for that. You know, it's double that <laughs> price almost and, and stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, it's an, it's an important factor for sure. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to talk to you about was, you know, how, how dining in senior living has changed over just, let's say, the, the past 10 years. And um, Patrick, do you want to take this one first? Um, sure. You know, w- when you talk about the dining and the la- changing in the last 10 years, you know, our, our residents, you know, is changing as far as their, their likes, dislikes, there's dietary guidelines, um, you know, preventive, you know, allergies, um, um, you know, preventive, you know, if they watch their sugar intake to their sodium. So us, as far as in the dining, the back of the house, we have to be concerned how we cook the food, what ingredients we use. Um, so, and the changes of the food, as far as the, um, you know, the um, the media has a play on how food looks. You know, the farmers markets, the cornerstone coffee shops, organic, gluten free. Um, so there's a lot of, and and people are more traveled too. So they, you know, they are aware of, you know, the 
the quality and the different types of foods out there. Mm -hmm. Well, and, 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 and just the populations have gotten so diverse too, in terms of what types of foods they, you know, they may like. Um, I think that that's a, you know, that's another big diversity issue. But, you know, when you look at, um, I, and I, again, my mom's been gone for a few years now, but I remember going to the nursing home and on the table was a card, you know, of, you know, could they chew their food? Did it need to be pureed? Um, were there allergies? Could they have sugar? Could they have salt? I mean, there were so many needs on that card and, and diversified. I just thought, how the heck do they ever keep this straight? Because it's, it's really quite complicated um, in terms of, of the, the nutritional needs and the mechanics of the food itself. And, and then yet we want it all, you know, steaming hot and looking presentable to boot when there's a staff shortage on top of it. Um, have you, have you seen, uh, you know, it seems like the, like the staff shortage has really increased, you know, in these past 10 years. Are there, are, am I correct in, in saying that? Uh Absolutely. You know, that was another thing when we were talking about starting our business was just the lack of training and, you know, culinary schools are closing because of the cost. And so our cooks and our chefs aren't being, you know, trained in the fundamentals of how to cook. And there's so much competition that, you know, if, well, if I don't like it here, I can just, you know, go to the place that's opening up down the street Mm -hmm. so you know it that's that's a huge a huge issue right now for all you know industries and even those the industries that we work with you know the linen company is always telling me how they're short staffed you know our food vendors are telling us you know we're hiring new truck drivers and everybody's looking for staff so everyone kind of understands the struggle and when you when you want to put out really good food and you want to exceed your customers' expectations and you know that your staff just isn't skilled enough to do that, you know, it can be it can be difficult. And you now that was one of the things we saw that could be a, a need for for Patrick is, you know, just mentoring and, and teaching people how to be good cooks, how to make sausage from scratch. And you know, we talked about the budget. Fresh food is more expensive than processed and canned food. Mm-hmm. But when you have years of when you have years of experience, you know how to how to do the budgeting and how to make room for that. And that really is what they want. They want fresh food. They want fresh salads, fresh fruits. And these these residents that are moving in, you know, we talk about all of these dietary guidelines, and some of them are physician required you know, because of their illnesses, but a lot of them it's by choice because they're so much more aware of what's good for them and, you know, disease prevention and well-being. And I like to exercise and I like to be healthy. And, you know, I always, I kind of, I tease Patrick when we go to a place like Panera, if you look at, you know, the senior citizens who are there with their laptops enjoying, you know, the salad and all these fresh ingredients, I see that's who's coming. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Those are the people that will be coming. That this yeah. is what they're going to want to eat. Yep. Well, and it's um, you know when I think of even the the age, I mean they didn't grow up with McDonald's. You know where, you know even at my age, McDonald's, and I'm you know I'm pushing sixty. McDonald's really didn't pop up, or I don't remember it really being an issue until I was a teenager. And yet my daughter grew up on McDonald's, you know, they were all over the place. Her kids, you know, McDonald's is just part of everyday consumption almost, you know, it's just that whole fast food industry has um, changed things. And, and yet, you know, there's, I, and I haven't seen it, the, what is it? Um, what the health on Netflix that's, that's out. And I want to see that because I think that that's going to have a big impact on how people look at processed foods versus natural um, 
intake as well. And, you know, there's always a controversy too of, you know, are, are the processed foods causing some of the illnesses that we're seeing, um, you know, with things and, and um, you know, the foods being genetically manipulated. And I mean, there's so many levels to food. And I think, um, I think nowadays people just, um, I, I think they're becoming more aware, but I think most are still in that mindset of well, just eat, you know, you just kind of grab it. And a lot of times it's grabbing it on the run. And again, in a, um, in a community situation, you know, it's, it's different because you, you have to plan for the meals and you have to meet regulations and, um, you have to meet the standards and um, uh, that's just got to be a really um, difficult job to do. And um, I, I would imagine there's got to be days where you guys just want to pull your hair out. I mean, but that's in most jobs nowadays too, you know, where, where things are, are just uh, all time consuming. Um, is there anything else that you want to add to kind of what's changed in the past 10 years? We talked about budget and staff and, and competition, which I think was a really good one to bring up because there is that threat that, you know, they'll just go down to the next spot if they don't like it here and they'll give me a deal because, you know, they need to fill their beds too. You know, one, one thing I want to really add is they're really looking for choices. Mm -hmm. and. That includes the independent to assistant to memory care, too. I worked in one facility, Lori, that we allowed the memory care to have choices. You know, mm -hmm. they just think, that, you know, one choice, they didn't get it plopped in front of them. So the, the servers or the nurses' aides actually went around maybe an hour, hour and a half ahead of time, and then they gave the choice to the, the kitchen. So then they had a choice of a hamper, they had a choice of the main entree, and so on and so on. But the neat thing was is that the nurse's aide sat down and ate with the residents. Mm -hmm. So it became more of a family type thing, but also, you know, if they wanted a slice of pie, if they wanted a ice cream, you know, this is their choices, mm -hmm. you know. So that's one thing that is changing. You know, people are expecting choices. Yeah, and I think that, you know, that's a that's a whole base of empowerment. It's a base of independence. And even, you know, when someone has dementia, you know, they might not verbally be able to tell you, um, depending on where they are in the disease. Um, but they can point to a picture, you know, you can read nonverbals and and get a pretty good idea of what um, what's pleasurable to them, you know, um, and what they don't like if we take the time to do that. So I think that that's a really, um, I, I think that that's just a really nice dignified um, piece to be able to offer. And I think it's, uh, I, I think it's something too that really needs to be pitched and told when people are doing tours. I, I, um, gosh, where was I? I was at a Silverado out in Colorado or out in, um, California, uh, one time. And, you know, and I've done a lot of tours through a lot of communities, but this tour was exceptional because she said why they did everything uh, from even the plates in the dining room that had lips on it so the food wouldn't slip off to the colors chosen to the chairs um, to the type of menu and she just explained everything and I think so often people doing these tours just you know show that it's pretty but they don't show why why it's important you know, they don't go into the depth of the choice um, and why management made those decisions when they didn't have to. And and yet when they're explained, you just are kind of in awe of, oh my gosh, they really, they really get dementia. They really get being dignified. And and that to me just puts you on the top of the heap immediately compared to somebody who's just kind of you know, 
doesn't really even understand. I think a lot of people out there don't really even understand because staffing is so short and a lot of times communication isn't always that great between departments in terms of why things um, are done the way they are. And I'm not saying all companies, I'm just saying, you know, it's out there though. And communication is really important. Do you feel a need for um, the the um, dining staff to be in direct contact with direct care and with nursing and, and really talking openly about choices and, and menus and um, service, just, I mean, everything that you do and deliver. Um, Patrick, I'll throw it to you on that one. Well, uh, they should be, you know, working hand in hand with each department because it's a, it's a full, you know, spectrum of the building. You know, everybody from the administrator to activities, to nursing, to the dietary. It's really a cohesive team because, you know, when somebody's not eating, you know, our wait staff in the dining room might notice that, you know, they're not eating their meal. So mm-hmm. that should trigger somebody in our, in our staff to go to nursing. Or when you bring a group activity to the activity, you know, food, food is revolving around it. You know, it brings pleasure to everybody. So uh, when you talk about, um, you know, bringing everybody together, nursing, administration, and sometimes they, they get so busy within their job that they lose focus. And when you talk about doing tours, Lori, mm-hmm. food, food is a huge marketing tool. It's one of the things that after everybody's decided to go to your facility, food is a, one of the top-notch things on the list. Yep. Um, besides the season care, you know. So mm-hmm. they've already made all the hard decisions. Now let's, you know, bring joy to their life you know, with food and mm-hmm. activity. So, yeah. Well, I, I do. I agree that that is a, a, a big piece. And just even, you know, um, the dining options. I mean, some some communities will have, you know, small family style. Some will have, you know, larger dining rooms. Some will have smaller dining that can be used for um, family gatherings and um, or bistros, you're seeing more of those popped up. And again, when it comes to dementia care, some people might be saying, well, that's in an assisted living or that's in a market rate. But there's a lot of people living with dementia in those settings that may be living with a spouse um, and they're still able to live at that level um, and not in necessarily a memory care. So, I mean, we have to look at a really wide spectrum. Um, when I go around the country, most um, senior communities will say, you know, chances are, you know, 70 to 80 percent of their clientele has some dementia symptoms, diagnosed or not. Um, you know, they're seeing that. So, you know, that needs to come into play. Do you see much changing? And I'm going to throw this one to Dawn um, in terms of use with uh, finger foods. Versus, you know, having to, you know, use a use utensils. Um, we do, we do some finger foods when you know they're when their ability they still want to feed themselves, but they cannot, you know, hang on to their utensil. We try to use adaptive equipment as much as we can. So we'll use silk up utensils. We'll use, you know, bench utensils. Uh, plate guards, different things to help them get food on their utensils. Mm-hmm. But when you know, when it comes to the point where you know they're going to they're going to eat well and they're going to feed themselves with finger food, then you know, then we do. We don't, um, you know, where I am right now, we don't have just like a finger food diet per se. So if if we're serving mashed potatoes for dinner. I don't make, you know, a, a resident French fries because they can eat that with their fingers. Mm-hmm. But we do serve a lot of sandwiches. We serve um, things that they can eat with their fingers. And then, you know, sometimes they will just they will just do that on their own. Mm-hmm. You know, I've seen residents actually eat salad 
with their fingers. I mean, they just start, you know, well, they put the fork down because they're having a hard time and they just start eating it, you know, mm-hmm. one piece of lettuce at a time. And, you know, it, it, it works for them. We, you know, we try to let them have as much independence as possible. Yet, you know, we have nursing assistants that are always available to assist. And we have some that, you know, they reach the point where they eat better if someone does actually feed them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that is the goal is, you know, trying to maintain as much nutrition as possible. So, you know, we we do what what works for the resident. Um, you know, each one is each one is their own individual and there's not, you know, there's not always a box that everyone fits in. Sure, sure. Patrick, anything you want to add to that? Um, no, not at this moment, no. Okay, okay. Yeah, I just, I, I remember again, I and I always flash back to my mom, I remember her being really upset and disgusted at somebody who was eating with their fingers and um, and I was just shocked at her reaction. But you know, with dementia, you lose your filters. Yeah. And um, I think what what scared her most was um, being worried that she might do that. You know, though she couldn't verbalize that, and I, and I could be wrong because it was something where she couldn't really. She wasn't at a place where she could um, tell me what the deal was, um, but she was just. Um, so disgusted and so upset that this person, you know, was using, um, using their fingers. I think it was with, with uh, mashed potatoes and um, she just couldn't understand why somebody wouldn't use their utensils. You know, she just couldn't, couldn't follow that. And so um, in the whole finger food thing, I I think it's, it can be multi-leveled in terms of, um, what's comfortable for the person um, so that they can have as much independence in terms of eating as possible. The other is, you know, the, how others perceive them to be. And, um, and then there's also that scary part that uh, can come into play of, is that going to be me next? Is that, is that what's going to happen with my disease? Am I going to progress to that? Am I going to, um, be embarrassed of myself, I think was really kind of more my mom's issue than, than not. And um, so I think sometimes we have to look at these issues in a, in a broad stance. And so often, you know, I hear um, people with dementia say, you know, I, I want the same foods. I know it's boring for you, but I don't need necessarily the diversity. I would rather have the independence of saying, I want a hamburger you know, because they can't read the menu anymore, or they can't, you know, making choices are difficult. How do you, how do you work with something, something in that order? Um, if you find someone's eating the same thing, is it still okay? Because it's, it's balanced. And I'll throw this one to you, Don, since you're the nutritionist in the, in the family here in the business. Um, sure, it's okay. You know, we have um, residents that we want them to eat, you know, whatever, whatever sounds good. And, you know, it's it's amazing. These people are living until well into their hundreds. And, you know, I, right now we have a 103 year old and I think I can't tell you how many times a day she wants scrambled eggs. She Mm -hmm. wants them for breakfast. She wants them for supper. And, you know, so she's eating eggs and toast. Otherwise, she probably wouldn't eat anything at all, you know, or, you know, the, the repetition is okay. And part of it is, too, they, they, lose their, they lose their appetite, and they also lose their sense of taste. Mm-hmm. And I've had you know, some residents I watch, and I just, you know, you're withering away, and what is wrong, and what can I, and they're like, you know, I just, things don't taste like they used to taste. Mm-hmm. And they, they they taste funny or they just taste different. And, you know, we also notice that as they age and, you know, I think maybe you noticed it with your mom. I think it's also a dementia thing is that they need stronger flavors in order to taste. 
And yep. I think they taste, they taste sweet more than anything. And so, you know, we would make sometimes smoothies or shakes with, you know, a lot of fruit in them so that they can taste at least the sweetness coming out of it. And, um, you know, like I said, it's, it's hit or miss and it's a lot of trial and error. And, you know, you're just so excited when you find something that, you know, that they enjoy. You know, we, we have residents, a lot of them, they like ice cream, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, ice cream, you know? Well, you know, an ice cream, I mean, it's, it's cool, it's smooth, it's easy. I mean, you don't have to chew it, you know, if there's, if they've got problems with their, their teeth or their mouth. I mean, there can be so many complications in terms of, you know, ability to chew or swallow or, you know, I mean, the list just kind of goes on and on with stuff. I, I saw a change too in their sense of smell and, um, that a lot of times, you know, for me, if I smell something, it's like, oh, then I get hungry, you know, and, but I can look at something and get just as hungry too. <laughs> but, but I think, you know, those things all have to do with anyways, for me, for appetite and, you know, desirability and things um, in, in what I'm looking at. And so, you know, and, and like you said, every person is different with that. And so it, it um, it's really uh, the whole food service thing is really so much more complicated than I think people give it credit for. Um, and yet it's such an integral part and, and such a plays such a major role in daily lives um, and the, and the health of individuals, you know, to boot it's um, it's, it is very, very, I think it's very interesting and, under um understood probably not a good way to phrase it but um all the different moving parts and um and the importance of it as a whole what what do you see coming as far as changes for the future in um in senior living dining uh patrick well uh, can i just uh, go back to what don was saying some of the um you know changes of the flavors and the strong is due really to their meds sometimes, their mm -hmm. medication. So it alters sometimes the flavor of food. And when Dawn talks about the strong flavors, it's about building layers of flavor within how you cook in your methods of cooking too. Mm -hmm. And also some of the stuff, you know, you talk about reducing some of the sodium out of the products because it activates different meds and stuff like that too. So, um, but to go back to your other question, the changes, what was your... Oh, i just uh, wondering what kind of changes you see coming down the pike for senior living. Um, you know, the way the buildings are being built, um, you know, the space, the dining rooms, um, more bistros, more grab-and-go, um, Anytime dining, um, when you go into some of the dining rooms today, you see tablecloths, table linens, napkins. Um, so then, you know, you get this expectations of, you know, what kind of food is coming out. Um, they're really promoting restaurant style dining, with, mm -hmm. uh, servers, mm -hmm. choices, courses. Um, so that's, you know, when people have traveled, they're used to this style of eating, you know. Um, so I, I look at, you know, the changes going that route, but also some of the changes that have to also happen as we talk about one of the biggest things in the industry is the dietary department is almost probably the second largest or third largest spend within the building. So they have to adjust some of these budgets. Mm -hmm. to allow the changes of the food and to meet the expectations of the new residents coming in, you know, with the fresh food, the different allergies to the organic to, you know, so there's some things that the companies have to learn to be able to adjust to meet these needs of the mm -hmm. residents. You know, yeah. There's a new, new group of people of the baby boomers coming. 
you know, they're, they're going to have different expectations. Very true. Very true. Um, Don, how about you? Do you see any, any additional things coming for senior housing or memory care specific? Well, we talked a little bit about, um, you mentioned, you know, family style dining and, you know, we see a lot of facilities that are going towards neighborhoods, you know, they're being built with neighborhoods or they're remodeling to create neighborhoods where, you know, a smaller environment where they can have family style dining. They also, um, you know, promote some of them, you know, actually doing the cooking right there in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So you prep as much as you can in the main kitchen and then you do the cooking in that neighborhood to create the smell, you know, to bring back those memories and to kind of, you know, stimulate their appetite. And, you know, um, and I think the things we've talked about with, you know, residents being food centric, you know, that that's just, we're just at the tip of the iceberg right now with all of that coming in, you know, they're just going to want more, you know, more of the fresh food, more of the, you know, what's good for me kind of food. And, you know, quality ingredients. Um, but, you know, Patrick can tell a story about the um, one of the places that he worked at recently where they would bake cinnamon rolls in the memory care. And, you know, the smell was just, you know, the residents loved it and the nursing staff loved it because of, you know, how actually calm it, it made the residents and how easy you should you should tell the story <laughs> well just like john was just like what john was saying about you know the fresh baked goods in the morning and it you know the nurses are starting around trying to get the residents up for breakfast and all that and so when you have a nice smell and aroma throughout the memory care you know bringing in fresh you know, caramel rolls or cinnamon rolls or banana bread, stuff that they really bring, you know, sense of memory to, and especially the smell. And then if you serve it to them warm, the whole morning just sets a whole different tone for the residents mm -hmm. because it brings that sense of memory, you know. Food, food activates a lot of different things for the folks. And, you know, it's how they grew up or if they were entertaining, the first thing they would have on their dining room table is a baked good, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it was their sense of giving or breaking bread with somebody or, you know, enjoying a cup of coffee with a, a slice of banana bread or a muffin or caramel roll. So there's no better reward than watching the residency when it's nice and fresh. Mm -hmm. You see the smiles, you see the engagement, everything. Well, and I think that's really true about that, um, you know, clicking back with the memories. Because, I, I mean, growing up, you know, people always bake stuff for their neighbors or they had little coffee get-togethers and it was, um, you know, it was just the pleasantries, you know. Um, or you, you had the cinnamon rolls, maybe not every morning, but on the weekends, you know, it was a special a special treat where now, you know, instead of baking it, a lot of times people just go pick it up, <laughs> bring it home. And, you know, you don't, you don't get that aroma. You don't, you know, it's, it's just different. It's very different. So I think, you know, knowing who you're catering to and the impact that that can have, you know, on people. Um, I remember a specific uh, time, again, my mom in the nursing home and, they were doing a picnic and, and she didn't really want any of her picnic food, but she, she decided she was going to eat her, the corn on the cob. And I remember mm -hmm. watching her. Now this is a woman whose teeth were all chipped and rotted and really should have been pulled out, but um, we didn't want to go there because we knew that would be very painful for her. And she sat and she ate that corn on the cob and she sucked and she nibbled on that. And she was so peaceful and so mm -hmm. happy she was just there was like this brilliance of comfort that just came off her body and i it was kind of like that movie when sally meets harry you know and the woman in the restaurant goes i want what, what she's having i mean that was my mom it was she was so peaceful and i think you know as she was eating that corn on the cob even though i had 
asked her, you know, should I cut it off the cob because of her teeth? And she looked at me like I was crazy. I think it brought her back to probably when she was a child at the fair or something. I mean, she was just yep. really in this intense, happy moment that you, if you were in her space or close to it, you could not not feel it. I mean, it was just that strong. And, and I think it's sad sometimes that those, those types of things are overlooked or not understood because we're moving too fast. Um, you know, to pay attention to the importance of those things. And, you know, for any of us, most of us, you know, we just kind of want a happy, peaceful life, you know, and it's usually not the big stuff that really makes us feel centered and connected. It's the, it's the little moments of joy. And I think food is, uh, can be so attached to that and can be, um, you know, such a, a, big, big player in, in helping um, the community at large, you know, as well as the individual and the family and the staff, but um, the community at large, helping them find that kind of almost peacefulness within their community. Um, But again, it it costs money and it takes time and you've got to have a company who, who truly understands the gifts that food um, can play and, and how it can impact behaviors. And, and I don't see in my travels and I could be, I could be wrong, but I don't see it in, in my travels, people talking about food um, as it relates to behaviors. You know, I see food being brought up more as, it might be brought up as an activity, you know, and a thing to do or a thing to, that we have to have um, or um, having to meet standards. But I don't think the true impact is really discussed. And maybe I'm wrong because I'm on the outside. Um, I, I would be really interested in your thoughts on that, um, both of you, um, Patrick and, and Dawn, in terms of how, how companies and organizations view food. Uh, I think, you know, there's, I think the the up and coming, you know, the the newer um, management companies that are building um, new places are starting, are starting to get it, that they understand the importance of food and that, you know, they don't always know where to start. Um, But, you know, even the ones that Patrick and I have worked at before, you know, some Mm -hmm. Some do get it and not, you know, not everyone does. And the people that are in the kitchen, the chefs, the, you know, the, um, the line cooks, the directors, we all get it. We know that these three meals are the highlight of their day because they talk to us about it all of the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I have a joke with one of the residents, you know, she'll come by and she'll say, Lunch was good today and dinner too. And I'll say, oh my gosh, what did I do wrong? If it's two good meals in one day, I should check that. I mean, it's just an ongoing joke. And, you know, or I'll post the menu for the week and show, you know, yep, got our favorite thing on Wednesday. I mean, they look so far ahead and they know, they know what's coming. And, Mm -hmm. you know, they let me know after the meal. They let me know before the meal. And it's, they come together for it's their it's their social time, mm-hmm. and you know, I love walking around and just seeing them, you know, and watching their faces and having conversation, and um, you know, it, it it's really it's really an important part of their lives, just as it is ours. It's like you said, you know, when you get together with people, it, it's over, you know, a glass of wine or a meal. And all of these memories come back to us because as we grew up, it was about Sunday dinner or, you know, your evening meal or, you know, oh, I remember when mom used to make this or I remember when dad, you know, would bring us donuts. And, you know, it's, it, it is just so important. And I think that's part of what we're trying to do with our company as well is get people to understand the importance and we can help them figure out, you know, how to get started on making it you know, center of, you know, 
of their, you know, the care for the residents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I as I'm sitting here listening to you, I I could just hear your passion come out and the connections and stuff, which is <laughs> which is really fun, and it just makes me feel like there needs to be almost a training program on. Um, on the behaviors of food, you know, of, of the impact that food has and, and breaking it down in terms of, you know, what happens when somebody doesn't like something or when someone doesn't feel that they have a choice or um, versus when they have choice, what does that look like, you know, and really having those conversations with, with management and with staff, because it's just, it, it it's so black and white when you when you step back and just think about those types of things you know it would make to me it would make it a much easier decision when they can see um when they can see food as it impacts um behaviors and reactions and how it can affect um a community you know clicking or not clicking and um you know how it can make things go really smooth or or really go off track um and yeah. and all it takes is one person and you can get that ripple effect mm -hmm. you know and and it's no different if somebody has dementia or or not i mean we've all been in a room where everyone's just fine and then that one person walks in and they just change the whole dynamics of the room that same thing happens you know, if you're having, you know, if someone's having a difficult time in the dining room, um, you know, that anxiety or angst or anger or joy, whatever it is, it, it ripples out. And um, so, sorry, get off track. I just, I, I just found that really kind of fascinating because I have not heard anybody speak on that. Um and that might be a good pitch for you guys. I don't know in terms of, of your company and your passion for dining and nutrition to, to help shift some of those mindsets out there. Um, what types of, um, I can't believe this hour has gone by so quickly. What types of, of challenges are you facing right now? And, and is there a way for the public to be able to help? Um, you know, uh, when I think about the challenges, Lori, you know, all the, the facilities have the same kind of challenges as far as either shortage in staffing, the, the morale, you know, it's, a domino, it's really what you spoke on. It's a rippled effect, effect. You know, when somebody's short in the back of the house, the front knows it. You know, mm -hmm. the residents see it too. It, it's, it's just a rippling effect. So where we like to step in or you know, the more training you give your staff, I believe the more retention you're going to have within your staff and they're going to enjoy their job, you know, greater. You know, you teach them passion about food, you inspire them about how to cook properly. Those things are all critical to having a good employee who's going to be able to want to go and touch the tables and be proud of what they served that day. You mm -hmm. know? So that's some of the challenges that, you know, the facilities are all, you know, challenged with, with staffing and knowledge. Yeah. Well, and, and so, well, some of the things that, that I see, and again, not in all places, but I think, uh, you know, staffing is, is tight. And when you're short, morale goes, you know, wonky on you. But I, I also, one of the things that I don't see happening as much as I'd like to see, and this is in a lot of different departments, not just food service, but is, is what you had mentioned that inspiring people to do better and to mentor and to really be part of the, the team that changes the culture. I, you know, I, I so believe in the power of one and and how we each can have a ripple effect, positive or negative, um, if if we consciously choose, you know, to do that. But I, I, you know, nowadays it just seems like people don't stay at a job or with a company. Everyone is kind of constantly a, in a new employee role. And then you lose that consistency and that history 
of of the needs and it, it, everyone's kind of starting from scratch over and over and over again and and that's not scratch in a good way where you're cooking from scratch and it's all natural and yummy, you know, but you're just, you know, scratching your head and going, okay, now what do I do? And um, it, we've got to somehow get above that line and, and have, have consistency in terms of delivery systems. And I think that that's a, um, I think that that's a really battle for all types of communities out there uh, in all different types of, of, um, of organizations with that. Um, is there, is there anything else that you'd like to like to add in terms of, of challenges um, that are facing kind of dining services? Don? Um, you know, the, the staffing is probably, you know, the biggest one, you know, that, Patrick and I both really, you know, we're passionate about what we do. We love what we do. And so, you know, when we're leading a staff, we empower them and try to, you know, really show them how they are making a difference. And, you know, the food at the location that I work is delicious. And, you know, I've had, you know, my cooks have a lot of longevity and I tell them all the time, you know, you know how much they all love your food and, and they taste the food and I taste the food and I would never serve anything that I'm not willing to eat or that I'm not willing to put in front of, you know, my own family. And, you know, I think in order to build morale and to build longevity, we have to empower people and really show them, you know, sometimes when you're just stuck in the kitchen, you don't get to know the residents. Mm -hmm. You don't see the impact that you're making. And, you know, I, I think that's important, but, you know, it's funny what you said about, um, you know, the residents, they, they know you're paying. So when I, when I serve in a dining room, if I need to, because, you know, some we're short staffed or whatever, you know, they always, I can hear them whispering, oh, that's the boss. Mm -hmm. They must be short today. You know what I, <laughs> and I always, I always laugh and say, you know, I, I'm undercover boss. I just tease them that, no, nope, no, nope, we're not short. I'm just pretending, you know, I'm undercover boss today. And, you know, don't make me cry. Just, you know, I haven't cried yet. <laughs> so, you know, but you just have to find ways to um, to really show how we are making a difference. And, you know, share the feedback with your staff and let them know that, you know, they really are making a difference. And that someday, you know, it could be their parents sitting there. It could be them sitting there. Yeah. You well, know, and... Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, the other challenge is just like you talked about budgets and, you know, with so much competition, it's, it's hard to fill a building, you know, you need full, you need room, you know, people in your rooms in order to make money and you need money to write good budgets. And when they, you know, keep taking money away from food, you know, it just makes it more and more difficult to, you know, to exceed the expectations and to give them, to give them what they want. And, you know, someone in a, in an office and, you know, at the corporate office is just flashing numbers to meet whatever the goal is without really understanding how they're affecting, you know, the people that they serve. Mm -hmm. yeah, the corporate office, you know, when, like John said about the, the people that sit in the corporate office, they look at the number, they, they look and said, okay, your budget is this. And the first thing that they typically slash, or slash is the, the food budget. Well, you know, like I said earlier on, food has been a huge marketing tool. Mm -hmm. So somehow, you know, they, this person who's never, you know, looked at training, looked at how to manage food or understand the purchasing of food or the inventory, they just look at a number. Mm -hmm. So they have to get out of that, you know, their comfort zone and go and visit and say, okay, I need to understand how all the mechanics work because yeah. it's more than, it's just more than saying you got $2 or $2 and 25 cents to spend on that meal. Mm -hmm. How is that going to make up? So, yeah. But, yeah. You know, well, I think one of the other things that I liked, you know, Don, you had mentioned about, being kind of relationship based, getting to know 
the residents. And I, I think that that, you know, we use the word person centered all the time, which I don't really care for. I really like more relationship centered because when we know one another mm-hmm. and when we feel there's that give and take, um, there's there's more respect, there's more dignity, there's more engagement, there's more feedback. Um, I mean, there's just more of everything. And, and I think people feel more comfortable. And um, versus person-centered, you know, to me says everything is about the other person. But it, but it truly isn't because you, everyone is always going to take care of themselves. They have to, you know, and, and all relationships are a give and take. And I think when we, when we put it out that, you know, we're just doing it for them, um, I think that that's a mistake because people lose sight of what they're getting by what they're doing, if that makes sense. Oh. Um, and well, wait, it, I think. You know what, people who are meant to do this kind of work understand, you know, how much they're getting in return for what they're giving. And, you know, it's it's just so rewarding. And these people have such a huge impact on, on Patrick and I. You know, we're constantly sharing stories and, you know, just you do. You become attached. And um, I, I love that you call it a relationship instead of just, you know, a person centered. I think that really sums it up. Yeah. There, because, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to oh, say I, it, it's really about being a, fa- you know, a family unit. And if you look at, and not everybody's family unit is perfect. I mean, really none of them are out there, but you know, we have this concept that family is there for one another and, you know, they're going to take care of one another and, and, um, you know, everybody wants to, you know, go home. And if we can give them that sense of home, that sense of family, um, through food, through environment, through relationships, you know, there's, there's many ways to do that. And to do that in a collaborative, I think, holistic fashion um, is, is really the most powerful and, and most beautiful. Because when people are in relationship, I mean, how many, how many staff have you heard say they're, they don't like their job, but they're going to stay because of the residents, you know, they, because they love their residents or they, they get along with the staff, even though it, it might, their job itself might not be totally fulfilling, but they stay for those relationships. And so I don't think we can undercut the basis of the relationship, Um, the relationship with, with food, with dining, with social engagement, you know, it's, it's all a piece of that relationship. And, and with that, um, we all react and, you know, when we don't like the reactions, we call them a behavior um, but being smart about what our trigger points are and, and triggers can be for good things Not they don't always have to be negative and, and really looking at those things and understanding those things and teaching those things um, to not only staff, but to families as well that are visiting, I think is really important too. Um, Patrick, you were going to add something else. You know, I, the thing, what I was going to add, you know, there's, you know, just endless rewards, you know, by doing this, by table touching, by getting to know the residents, you get to know their little quirks and what they like and their dislikes. So it's just totally rewarding. You know, you see the joy of their smile, even though that they can't communicate completely, but you know, you've done well Mm -hmm. by their engagement. So yeah, that's what I was going to add. Yeah, what I was going to wrap up with, how do you know you've made a difference? But you've just, you know, you've said, you know, you you just nailed it. You know, it's uh, if you slow down and, and look and pay attention, you know, you, it doesn't necessarily have to be through words. It could be a glint in the eye or a smile or a giggle or a touch or, you know, a thank you. I mean, there's just so many different different ways um, to see and feel that you've made made a difference and I, I thank you both for for being with us today and and sharing you know your stories um, 
why don't we just um, sum up, and um, Patrick, I'll just have you do this. What types of services can Passion for Dining and Nutrition offer um, communities? Well, we offer quite a few different services, but really, you know, a hands-on training in their environment, uh, meaning at the facility. We, we offer everything from basic technique skills, you know, knife skills to making sauces, uh, and just cooking good food from scratch, you know. Mm -hmm. And then we can get into more management, too, how to control budgets, how to control numbers, um, purchasing, you know, knowing your ingredients, you know. So I also do interim food service director. Um, when you're out of the food service director for X amount of time, your morale really goes down. Uh, I also help in designing kitchens to make the kitchen flow better. Um, you know, when you're looking at different components, it, it takes a certain way of setting up that line and having certain equipment to make the kitchen flow so you can offer choices. Mm -hmm. So, so really, you know, the, the ability to work on menus, uh, more nutrition, you know, uh, well-balanced menus, working on their cycles. Okay. Wonderful. Anything you want to add? Don, oh. uh, anything you want to add? Um, no, I don't think so. I think he, you know, he summed it up pretty well. There, there's not a lot that Patrick can't do after, you know, almost 40 years in this business. So, you know, and I think you can probably tell we're, we're just, we're passionate about food. We love food and, you know, we love working with the residents and building connections. So that's, you know, that's what we do. Well, great. And um, people can get a hold of you by going to your website, which is pdn, and that's difference.com, pdn for um, passion, dining, and nutrition, difference.com. Um, or do you want to give them a phone number at all or an email address, or is it best just to go through the website, Patrick? Um, I can give you my phone number as well in our website our email address too. Our, uh, our phone number is 651-231-1433. Okay, great. And our, web, and our website is, I mean our email address is uh, patrick at pdndifference.com. Okay, wonderful. Well, that's great. Well, again, I want to thank you both so much for being with us today. Really appreciate your your time and your dedication and your passion um, for making um, remarkable moments uh, with with people with dementia and just in senior living. And I would imagine pretty much whatever you do when you touch food, um, you're putting a smile on someone's face. So thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, Lori. Thank you very much, Lori. Great. In wrapping up, I just want to, again, throw out, uh, if you want to join us on the cruise, the Dementia Friendly Cruise and Symposium, November 11th through the 18th. You'd have to do that pretty quick because that'll be closing out in two weeks here. Uh, just go to alzheimerspeaks.com. You'll see the cruise on the front page. Click on that, and then you'll want to talk with Kathy Schof who is our travel agent. Um, keep in mind, all of our shows here on Alzheimer Speaks are archived, so you can go back and listen to those anytime. Uh, we just spoke with Cindy Bach, who um, is a dignified dementia coach. We had Katie Bow Bowman on last week, and she will make you look at exercise totally different. And we also had uh, Cheryl Stevenson on, and she talked about how relationships change once you are diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, which she is. If you are um, out in Massachusetts or Connecticut area, I will be um, out there October 24th through the 26th. Reach out to me. I always like to meet uh, my followers and I'll be doing some presentations and then also a screening of his, his neighbor, Phil, while I am out there. Um, have a blessed week and we will talk with you all soon. Thanks now. Bye. 
Well, hi, I'm Lori LeBay, and I wanted to tell you about Alzheimer's Speaks, which is another great podcast. You see, my own mother lived with dementia for 30 years, and I felt lost. Did you know every three seconds someone in the world is being diagnosed with dementia? Odds are it's going to hit your families too. We want to help you connect to services, products, tools, research, and stories so you can be prepared. Please subscribe to Alzheimer's Speaks on your favorite podcast platform.